So hello everyone, welcome back to our third session of today's virtual event on the working in the new digital normal. I, I hope you had the chance to listen to our previous two sessions. And if not, I'll quickly catch you on. So yes, we are going through a major transformation of our work reality. Many of us have now the opportunity um, and sometimes it's the privilege of working remotely and from home. However, this puts a different strain, strain on our technology infrastructure, but also creates the need for rethinking what the workflow looks like and how we create that digital environment to create a better experience for all of us. More importantly, hopefully you heard the word inclusive, creating an inclusive environment that can be accessible for people with limited abilities, with limited access, um, limited knowledge uh, that they may have about some of these technical solutions. More importantly, we need to ensure that uh, we take into account the uh, inclusive design thinking principles, which will allow us to create better um, or use better typography, create more legible text and incorporate other design elements that make a big impact on the productivity and the accessibility of, of the solutions and, and the experience. And I'm thrilled to have this session dedicated to that specific topic, creating a better inclusion and in the workplace, be that through the technology we're using, through the choices we make in, um, in designing the, the workplace and the experience, as well as the communication to include all of, uh, all of the people in this distributed uh, work environment. With that, I'm thrilled to introduce Fanny Crivoy, who is the founder of Studio Analogous. She is also teaching inclusive design at the Pratt School of De Design. And everything that she does, it's about inclusion. We'll then have our um, own principal researcher, Laura Sabatini, uh, who is going to talk a little bit more about inclusive or inclusivity in the distributed communication. With that, Fanny, take it away. Thank you so much, Stella. <clears throat> Thanks for putting together this amazing conversation and for including me. I'm going to share a presentation. Um, so um, the setup from this morning is, is excellent because there's so much we can do to make things better for all of us, for employees, for consumers, for everybody involved in, in our day-to-day -day business. And now, you know, inclusive brand experiences are important always, but now that there's a screen in the middle between us and everybody else, it's really important because screens really can be a, a blocker. They can be a blocker from, from good experiences and good interactions between employees and their brand and from consumers and their brand. So I'm going to take you first, give you an introduction. And I know uh, some points have been touched on earlier today and some of you know all this. And then I'm going to give you some specific toolkits that things that you can do as an individual and as a member of an organization to make the digital experience better for everyone. So as you know, inclusion is, is really the right thing to do and it's the law, but it's really good business and it builds strong relationships between uh, everybody and their brands that they interact with. So, and I'm sure you know all this data, how um, most of the disposable income is in the hands of the 60 plus um, years old, how you have a much higher return with that diverse workforce and the size of the disability market that it's $175 billion. Um, so it's, there's a huge potential uh, for making things right uh, and huge benefits. And, you know, the potential is in the foreign born, underbanked, older adults, veterans, LGBTQ, minorities, women, foreign born, uh, disabled, uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, and the shift is really already in motion and there's already a new business model going even before all this pandemic started. Um, this is an example, which is an off of non-digital example, an analog example. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with the brand OXO, that they designed all these kitchen utensils that are so great to use. And it all started because, because Sam Farber, the founder, he saw that his wife Betsy had some mild arthritis in her hands and she had difficulty performing day-to-day -day tasks in the kitchen. So they started tweaking and improving the design of those simple utensils to now, you know, the black one on the far right 
and that so many other brands imitate and how solving the problem for somebody that has a limited ability creates a better product for everyone else. Um, some other examples are, for example, Tommy Hilfiger, and they a few years ago came up with a new clothing line called Runway of Dreams, which is an adaptive line of clothing that doesn't use like tiny buttons, that it's all Velcro and magnets and flexible fabrics so that it's very easy for somebody with limited ability to put it on and off. But who doesn't want comfortable clothes that is easy to put on and off? So that line was the fastest selling line in the history of Tommy Hilfiger as a whole. Or the example in the middle, Virgin Airlines. When they added accessibility features to their website, their sales went up 60%. They didn't do more advertising. They didn't change their product. They just made it more accessible. And that already made a huge difference. And we'll, we'll see what that means. Um, and then Tesco, the online grocery chain in the UK, um, they had two sites in parallel. One for the general public that had bells and whistles and animations and beautiful stuff. And then the other one that was sort of a more basic accessible experience. In the end, everybody was drawn to the accessible uh, website. So in the end, they, they, they just ditched the, the general public one because people like, uh, like to feel smart. They like to go to a digital experience or an, an analog experience when we can do that again and feel that they're smart, that they can do this. Um, so it really all starts with the brand DNA. Uh, what is your insight? What are your goals what's your vision for the brand and then you think about your team how do you create an inclusive experience for the employees whether they're remote or, or local in your operations um, and then you start thinking about your products and your services and your sales like virgin's website um, and then you think about your clients and your partners and what channels you use and what suppliers you use. And I actually, um, I saw Rashma uh, speaking at the panel before from Microsoft. I, Microsoft is, is a brand that I love because they are truly inclusive inside out. And I heard from the um, chief accessibility officer there that they only will use a car uh, service vendor if they have an accessible product. So like an Uber. So they wouldn't even hire a car service for their employees if they don't have accessibility. So that is a brand that has inclusion in their DNA, in that sort of center circle there. So this is what an inclusive ecosystem is and, and how we need to look at everything with that lens. So now understanding the audience, how do we understand who we're speaking to? Um, the principle of universal design is that we design products that are used easily by as many people as wish to do so. And certain brands are exclusive and that's what they are and that makes sense. But even then, um, they need to think about how to include everyone in that segment. So for example, in the bottom area, you can see a fifth of all adults have difficulty carrying out everyday tasks with everyday products. That makes them the largest minority group um, and this that I'm going to show now is part of uh, the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit, which I'm a big fan of, and how they explain what are temporary situational limitations with the different senses. And they created uh, this excellent chart that um, it tells you, for example, with all the different senses, how you can move through a spectrum depending on the situation. So for example, for touch, some people lost an arm and they cannot touch with two hands. But some people, maybe I just fell this morning and I have a cast or my arm hurts. And so I'm, I'm using my other hand to perform tasks. Or I could have just had a baby and I have the baby in my hand, so I only have one hand and I'm pushing the stroller. So that gives you a sense of, of what that can be. Um, for for uh, vision, some people are visually impaired. Maybe some people have cataracts. So they've just, for now, they're not, they're not seeing that well. And um, some people are just distracted. I'm driving and I'm looking the other way and I don't see what I need to see. For hearing, for example, some people cannot hear permanently, but some people just have an ear infection and, and have difficulty hearing. Or there are jobs that are very noisy, like, you know, drilling on the street or a bartender that 
works in a very noisy environment and cannot hear properly. Um, and then for speaking, there, there's definitely people that are nonverbal, but I could have a sore throat and not be able to speak, or I could have a heavy accent as, as I do. Um, so you can see that by thinking about people in these scenarios, um, it's really important when we're creating experiences for our employees or for our customers to really be very intentional about seeking out the points of inclusion. Uh, identify situational challenges. Maybe it's not all the time. Maybe it's only when it's cloudy that the reflection doesn't work, or maybe, you know, there are different scenarios. Um, recognize personal biases, which is um, always an important aspect. Or um, it is very important also to offer different ways to engage uh, because people should be able to choose how they interact with you and they should have options. And that really makes it truly accessible. Um, and those different options should be equivalent. It shouldn't be like one that is crappy and one that is great. They should all be um, very even. And then extend the solution for everyone because uh, this is the best definition of accessibility that I've seen, that it's maximum personalization. Let people interact with you the way they want. And why are we talking about this today at this conference? And why does it make sense for us to think about it? It's because all of us here are either part of a team at a company or we're an entrepreneur, but we're all consumers. And as any of those, we have the power to make things more accessible and also request from the stores that we work from, from the tools that we use at work, from our own uh, corporations or organizations to really make things more inclusive. Um, even as an individual, we all create Word documents, we all post on blogs, we all create videos and post them, uh, create PDFs. So, and there are ways to make all of those um, accessible. And by the way, this is a huge topic. We're just like seeing like the very, very tip of the iceberg. So now we're starting with the toolkit. First, if use of color. Colors can have a lot of contrast, like the circle with the black and white, or they can have very little contrast, like the circle with the one and one. Um, and the key is really to aim for contrast, especially for critical information. And this is a, 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 a tiny little exercise. So if you see all these options here, these are icons in different sizes and different colors. If you can, can you try to identify which ones are the most accessible one? And you can just type it in the chat. Um, and I'll be monitoring the chat. So I'll be shouting if people okay. are getting the hang. See if you can guess which of these are, are one and six, six. Okay. So this is, this, one. this is what you can see. So interestingly, the bigger ones were not the most accessible ones because the contrast was not uh, the highest. Some of the smaller ones that you see here had the most contrast, so they become more accessible. So it's just something that we sometimes don't think about. Um, and, and it makes a big difference. And then another important point to be aware of is that there is a huge percentage of the population that has color blindness. So they don't see colors the same way um, that everybody does. So the, in this chart, the left column is a full color vision. But then the other three colors, the columns, I, are different types of color blindness and they see colors differently. That is, why it's so important when we create an informational presentation, website, whatever it is, not to rely exclusively on color for exclusive information. So for example, if you put a sign and, and you want it to be uh, a, a, something very important in red, that it's danger, add the words or add an icon. Don't rely only on the color because as you can see, very few people actually see red or green. So this is something to keep in mind uh, when choosing color. Another really important tool is typography. And of, as you know, there are like hundreds of thousands of fonts out there. Definitely choose one that is legible, but also the optimal number of words in a sentence uh, to make it easy to read is seven to 11. And that is because our eye goes horizontally and then it has to go back to the beginning of the next sentence. When we make things that are so spread out, it's very hard for the eye to go back and then the eye gets tired and then we lose people. 
Um, also, you know, the, the spacing between the lines um, is important so they're not very crunched together. And here's another quick, quick exercise. Um, so you can see all this uh, writing here, many options, many font sizes and colors. Can you try to guess which ones are the most accessible? And you can put it in the chat. 10, 7, 1, 5, 10 and 7. Yeah, some of those are five. right. So these are the ones, the ones, of course, that have the most contrast. And what that means is not that we cannot use color, but use color when the type is big, when the text is not essential. Whenever it is important, definitely aim for more contrast. Now, let's talk about images, graphs, and charts. Um, as you know, images really say so much, and it's important that people can understand what we're trying to say with the images, and it's also important that we compensate for those that cannot see the images. So, for example, these images are not optimal because, for example, the one on the top left, this, this, the landscape is very busy, very detailed, and you really cannot tell what's going on. The one in the bottom is very blurry. Uh, and the one on the right, it's, it feels fake. It feels like fake smiles. Uh, the group of people is very homogeneous. Everybody is the same age, the same color, the same fake smile. So it really reflects that on, on your brand. However, there are these photos here, for example, that uh, they're more details, they feel more authentic. Um, they have an interesting crop. And so this is sort of some rough guidelines that um, can tell you, for example, how to represent your target audience. And by the way, there's a, actually a very good story and why it's important to always have a diverse team and to always involve people that are different than you uh, when you come up with things. Because when I did this presentation um, a, a few months ago, um, somebody in the audience really disliked that photo of the girl and she thought uh, she had like an insect or something on the nose. Whereas I thought it was a beautiful photo with an authentic smile uh, and very human. And uh, so that's why we should involve different people when we create anything. Always invite somebody different than you uh, to get a different perspective. Anyway, so not to be easy, original, try to convey emotions, try to tell a story and try to keep them simple. Um, simplicity works much better. So how do we tell stories also with data? And uh, how do we let people appreciate the insights of the data when we create graphs and charts? So because of the color um, points that we just made a few minutes ago, it's really important not to rely exclusively on color when we are um, creating graphs. So in, in this case, for example, we have two textures. So if the people cannot differentiate between the colors, they can definitely see the textures. Um, additionally, when you are labeling rather than putting a legend at the bottom and say, oh, blue means this and red means raspberries, ideally add the label to the, the part of the graph that you're labeling because that makes it easier for people that cannot distinguish color. Lastly, all the images, all the charts and all the graphs need alternative text. Alternative text is uh, something that we add to our photos or our charts that tell the story of what's going on for people that cannot see it. People that cannot see well, they use readers. So Google has a reader, Microsoft has an excellent reader, Apple has a great reader. And what that does is that it sniffs the content either of the website or the presentation and it reads uh, things to the, to the user. And when there's an image, it will say, here's an image and here's what it says. So we need to write the alternative text, text for those images. So some tips on how to make them better. Make them short, less than 125 characters, because a lot of the um, readers skip after 125, they stop reading. Also go straight to the point. Don't start with, this is an image of, or this is a photo of. Um, and then include some keywords so that it helps you with your search uh, SEO, but don't add too many because it makes a bad experience and it confuses. Um, so here's an example. And, um, 
Stella, you tell me when I when I'm I'm running out of time. Um, then here's an example. So here's this photo, and it's in a context. And for example, a bad old text would be a baseball player hitting at a ball a ball at a baseball field. But a good one would be much more specific. It would be David Ortiz of the Boston Red Sox batting from home played at Fenway Park. So even if I'm not seeing that photo, I can imagine it in my head. Um, and here are a couple more examples. So for example, on the left, the right way would be orange mural that says ship it on a wall at HubSpot Singapore office. Or the one on the right would be business school professor pointing to a female student at a computer screen. I hope that you can get a, an idea. And this is something you should do on your blogs, on your website, on your presentations. And it goes as well for the charts. So now let's talk about video. Um, video um, has many options. Uh, one is you can add a transcription of the video on the same page. So um, people can choose to do either. Um, also now, YouTube and Vimeo are doing a great job with captions. And the nice thing about captions is that it is a little different than transcription because captions sometimes adds nonverbal cues. For example, applause or music background or uh, breathe, you know? So they, they help compensate what they cannot hear with what they, what they see on the captions. Okay, forms. A lot of us depend on data. And like people were discussing before, polling. Uh, to take polls is, is uses forms. Like forms are ubiquitous these days. And forms with the um, continuous stylization of design, sometimes we've missed some targets on usability and accessibility. And it doesn't mean that we cannot experiment with how forms look, but definitely make sure that they're accessible because the better the data that you collect, the better you can read the results and, and learn from it. So for example, the form on the left is a line that doesn't really define the field. And also, this happens a lot. The instruction is inside the field. And what happens with that is that, let's say that I start filling out this form and then the phone rings and I take my call and when I go back to my form, the instruction disappeared because I started typing on it. So that is a missed opportunity for accuracy and for user experience. And uh, the one on the right, for example, has a very uh, clear outline. The, the description is outside, so it won't disappear. Uh, and then I know exactly what to do and, and it doesn't go away. Um, now let's talk about links. Uh, so when we write emails, build a website, create a presentation, we, we add a lot of links in it. And uh, it's important that they stand out with color, with underline, with weight of, of typography, and make sure that you're very consistent and that you're thinking about a system each time that you use that treatment, that it, it means it's a link. And here, for example, is, a, is, is something very important. It's not just making it look like a link, because here they both look like a link. It's what it says. Uh, if you say, click here, the chances of people clicking there are slim. When you're descriptive and you say, see Britney Spears, then people feel compelled because it, it's an invitation and you get a glimpse of what's gonna happen after they click. I hope this makes sense. Um, lastly, um, delivery. So like I said, we all create PowerPoints, keynotes, Acrobat PDFs, and web and digital. And this is a huge topic. So again, this is just touching on the surface. There are three components that will make that accessible. In terms of structure, take advantage of, of PowerPoint uh, accessible templates. They are already out there and you just need to use them and leverage. When you use the templates, whether they're accessible or, or you're creating your own, make sure that you use master pages and you respect the title and content structure because the readers read like that. The readers read in the order that you created the elements, not the order that they are on the page. So if you created first the footer and then the headline and then the caption and then the body copy, it will read it that way regardless of how you would read it from top to bottom and left to right. Um, in terms of content, um, this, this is a lot of what I was telling you about. And always add the alternative text to your images and to your graphs. 
And Microsoft has a great tool, which is um, the preview tab. So you can actually test how accessible um, your presentation is. And it is more work, but uh, it's definitely worth it. Um, so just to recap, uh, we, see, we know there's a lot of potential out there. We know that you can manipulate color and typography, um, photography, charts, use alternative text, um, videos, make sure that you have a transcript and captions, links, forms. You as an individual and as a member of the community have the power to affect so much around it, around you. And that the fish, this shift is already in motion. Um, so there are new business models out there and in this situation and at this moment, there's a huge opportunity to, to really turn things around. Um, so let's get rid of those blocks and on behalf of the people with different abilities globally and all of us here, um, put inclusive branding at the center of your brand in everything you do because every bit helps. Thank you. And I'm including here how to learn more about it and you can reach out to me if you have more questions. Um, I'd be happy to. And th thank you so much, Fanny. I know this is barely scratching the surface on all the details, but I think now more than ever, we have the opportunity to learn about the limitations that we can help others overcome through technology. And there are tools, there are techniques. It's more about the mindset that all of us can embrace to, to use these uh, tools that we have at our disposal. So now that we dove into the technology and the mindset, I'd love to also uh, touch upon the inclusive conversation and ensuring that when we move in a distributed uh, workplace, we don't forget how important it is to um, continue to connect with others and include everybody in the conversation. Laura Sabatini is our principal researcher here at the conference board. She's been studying the diversity and inclusion space for quite some time, and I'm thrilled to welcome her for the next segment of this session. Thank you, Stella, and thank you, Fanny. That's a great presentation, and um, actually reminds me, uh, you know, when you teach classes, too, that's not um, something that only applies to the instructor, but also can apply to when you have students' presentations. Actually, it happened in one class where students were presenting on a topic and um, and there were a couple of students who were colorblind and they couldn't uh, see other students' presentation. And so we sort of had to go back and, and revise their presentations because of that. So it's a great, great tips. So I am going to, first of all, let me check. Stella, can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. I'm going to shift uh, and build on what we heard from Fanny as well as what we heard previously today uh, to a little bit more specific topic, but then again, I think you'll see that connects really well with the discussion. And this is about communicative inclusively as a virtual team. So uh, we discussed today how right now many organizations are faced with this new way of working. Uh, and many organizations had a uh, or people and employees or teams that were dispersed or remotely before. Uh, but this might be an opportunity to sort of build and rethink about how communication happens. One of the common complaints that you hear when it comes to inclusion uh, and when you heard prior to this crisis is how oftentimes remote employees or remote or employees that are working from different offices may not always feel as included as uh, others, those that are in the headquarters or those that are in the main office. And a, a lot of it can go back to having access to the tools and, and technology that we've been talking about. Some of it also has to do how you use those tools and technology and an extent to which you're communicating in a way that is inclusive. So uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk about some key considerations to make if you want to take this opportunity now to rethink about your communication strategy. This can be organization-wide or can be even within your team. And, um, and I'll have some examples, you know, I collected several examples from companies and teams that are, uh, you know, being very creative in how they're using the technology uh, to build more inclusion. Before we even get to the examples, though, it's important to um, structure your strategy around two things. One, uh, the value of inclusion. 
So before you can create an inclusion communication strategy, it has to be clear why inclusion is important. And there has to be some communication about that, why that's a value or why that's a priority for the organization and for the team. So this is a way to uh, build, make the case and build transparency, uh, allow for trust and psychological safety, that is people's ability you know, to speak up if they have concerns. Uh, and so on. And, and, and also value inclusion speaks to what Fanny just described, that is making sure that everybody has access to the information uh, either uh, through the tools or even by being informed and by clear communication. So we're going to discuss some of those examples. The second part, though, that I think many organizations sometimes skip has to do with uh, revamping and reorganizing your communication strategy. Sort of take a step back to how you may communicate when everybody's in the office in the same place and the same time, and a change the structure of guidelines and norms to better adapt to the new normal, as many call them, but it could be just to better adapt to make sure that you're including virtual teams, uh, teams that work in different locations, teams that work in different offices, people with different abilities, and so on. So again, this can be an opportunity to step back, look at what's working and not working, and sort of reestablish new norms and practices. So the three bullets that I have here are communicate expectations proactively. This may apply to leaders, but uh, also to others. And again, I'll have several examples. Share information equitably. Uh, people who are virtual, non-virtual, different teams, different opportunities, and check in regularly. And you know, we have several examples of these different things. So uh, value inclusion. There's a lot of uh, different definitions of inclusion. Ultimately, uh, you know, I'm, when I'm speaking about inclusion and inclusion in communication in the workplace, uh, I'm speaking about everyone's opportunities to feel like they belong, they have a voice, um, they uh, have access to the same resources and opportunity. Um, one recommendation is that, you know, we've done some work at the conference board on diversity and inclusion, and one recommendation that uh, can be very helpful is to take, you know, general definition of inclusion and try to customize it uh, to your organization and to your team and make it, make that connection with your values, your business, your industry, and make it come alive within your organization. A study, when it comes to communication, um, this is a, a slide from a study that the conference board did a couple of years ago, where we find that inclusion lives a lot of different interactive level, right? So uh, the personal inside perception of inclusion has to do with whether we feel like we belong and feel like, again, we have a voice is sort of part of the original definition. Uh, but that perception can be impacted by a lot of different things. And it's interesting to see how being virtual or being working alone from one office can impact that perception. And that's why um, uh, being more proactive can uh, help that. However, in inclusion can also be felt where you're interacting with others within your team or with your managers, right? So uh, others' behaviors or how others treat you may make you feel like you're included or not. And the last level has to do with the whole organizational-wide sense of inclusion. So um, there is, it's very possible that someone may feel included within their team, but feel not included within the larger organization. It's something that actually research is finding can be quite common. And so the larger, the larger pra practices and processes that are organization-wide can also be used very um, for, for creating more inclusive way of communicating. And so the tips that we're going to discuss ideally uh, would allow for all these three levels to um, become more inclusive. And that's why it's important to be consistent across different organizations and set, have some sort of guidelines that allow for, the, for consistency so that it doesn't happen that you may have one team where everybody feel very included and uses particular tools and another team that uh, does not have the same experience. Um, so as I mentioned, um, 
ideally these communication tools and the way in which you think about inclusion also applies to different roles that you may have within your organization. So oftentimes we think of inclusion at a team level or you know, a larger organizational level, uh, but it's also helpful to think about how individual contributors um, uh, you know, experience uh, the communication and the inclusion. And so when developing a new communication strategy or structure, consider all the roles that you have within your team and your uh, communication. Um, you know, you may have contract workers, you may have, uh, you know, non-traditional sort of employees and how do, can you make the uh, different groups included in the communication? So we, I'm, I'm gonna get to the examples really quickly. I wanted to share something that again, builds on what Fanny uh, just uh, described that is assessive technology. Uh, so now let's think about how can, once we have these assessive technology and, and, and design in place, how do we apply and use those tools so that there is a, a inclusive communication? So some examples here has to do with, for example, okay, can you use technology to uh, make sure that people with different ways of learning or different ways of thinking can contribute? You know, an example that comes to mind is that, you know, you may have people that um, are especially effective working in teams and, and, and they're good brainstorming or become very innovative when they're brainstorming with others. And some they need to step back and think about it on their own before um, you know, they, they can really come up with uh, new ideas. So there's different styles to be innovative. So the technology can provide opportunities to sort of uh, apply both styles. So it can be uh, breakout rooms or, or you know, brainstorm, different types of brainstorming activities that make sure that people participate in different ways. Again, I, another example of teaching would be, for example, in um, the class that I teach at NYU, I give people the opportunity to get participation credit for speaking in class, but also for contributing to the discussion board. And, and what I see that as, you know, again, the, the way on to make sure that people that may be, uh, you know, more of an introvert, so if I don't feel like jumping in, uh, can still contribute. And this actually has uh, important implications for also when we have meetings where there might be people in the room and other people calling in. And I'll give some examples there too. Uh, finally, last but not least, again, uh, the uh, opportunity to collaborate teamwork um, is when you have tools uh, now, you know, Teams was mentioned, Yammer, that really allow to uh, people to be more collaborative, but there has to be some guidelines and and uh, communication around that so that uh, everybody knows um, how these tools can be used and you don't end up having just some group collaborating and others not. So how do we do that? Uh, and in the, as I mentioned before, a key element uh, to create more inclusion is to establish and brainstorm new structures, guidelines, and norms. It can be helpful uh, to uh, sort of rethink how you are communicating. Um, when I mentioned at the beginning the importance of being proactive, that applies to leaders, but also team members. So now that you are in a different work setting, it might be worth to think about your uh, expectations uh, proactively and to communicate them proactively. It can be very simple examples like saying, you know, I'm not a morning person, so please don't, you know, schedule meetings before 5 a.m. or so something like that. Um, but there's uh, also ways of working and, and working in teams can be helpful. Also, uh, establish new norms around day-to-day -day communication. So the opportunity that I see now from a diversity and inclusion perspective is that you may be able to build new practices now when many people are working remotely outside the office, then then will create more inclusive communication and more inclusive work environments when people do go back to the office, but there's still gonna be team members that are virtual. So this can be a great opportunity. Um, the research on virtual working says that it's helpful to have more structure, not less. Again, and this is just to provide more consistency and, and more opportunity to sort of check in um, and um, ground rules and you know and communication 
can happen about things that maybe you're given, taking for granted. You know, there's a lot of written rules in organization that have to do with when meetings happen, uh, work, work core work hours, are you expected to be, uh, um, you know, work certain times, at our times, uh, communication preferences. Uh, you know, there's teams that have very clear preferences in terms of whether you're communicating by email or, uh, for example, on a chat, chat room or, or, or a collaboration room. Uh, so setting up those guidelines can really help to make sure you're more effective, but also that everybody is kind of uh, communicating in, in similar ways. And also it could be helpful to have, um, you know, new technologies that support this type of communication. Uh, now, uh, related to uh, creating this structure uh, is sharing information equitable. So one of the challenges that you face when it comes to diversity and inclusion uh, in a physical office is that sometimes you may have information shared informally. You know, there's the famous water cooler, it could be after hour, or, uh, drinks or so on. So some uh, people may get more information about uh, what's happening in the culture and opportunities than others. So again, this reshaping your communication strategy may give you the opportunity to make how, how you share information more equitable and to set up some ground rules. Uh, basic examples could be, you know, time zone, holidays, um, uh, you know, pick hours for um, parents that have um, kids in schools and so on. Uh, and instead of leaving all these sort of expectations for individual managers to figure out on their own, that could be general guidelines that organizations or team provide. Um, I worked with an organization a while ago, for example, that had set up Friday afternoons and no meeting uh, time. It was a time for everybody to sort of wrap up the week and so on. And so meetings could not schedule on Friday afternoon unless absolutely necessary for some emergency. Uh, and another one, um, you know, uh, an organization that had like the Excel sheets where they included all the time zones of people that belong to a team so that uh, when scheduling a meeting, you could see uh, what time it was for each team member. And they ended up actually rotating uh, who had given that when you have a global company, you may not have the flexibility of always having a meeting at one hour. Um, but they would rotate by meeting who would have the after hour, for example. So there's different rules that can be applied and can be customized to your organization, but that are communicating basically, again, the value of employees, but also are creating clear norms that everybody can use. Uh, during meetings, that's another great example to consider. Uh, this is very common when you have meetings where people are in the office and others are virtual, that people are virtual may not always have the opportunity to jump in. When you are at the chat room, not everybody's monitoring or checking the chat room. Um, if someone, again, may, you know, may not feel comfortable interrupting others and may not have the opportunity to really speak. So there's different practices. You now, one organization has um, a person in the room always allocated to uh, monitoring the chat room while a meeting is happening so that the person in the room can sort of raise their hands for people who have questions on the chat room. Um, another uh, organization um, I worked with a few years ago had, had this rule where if you had a staff meeting, if you had one person calling in, then everybody needed to act and, and connect uh, as if every, you know everybody else was also calling in. So not to exclude the person calling in, everybody would need to keep uh, the computer and chat, um, you know, uh, be connected to the chat room so that everybody can, can contribute. These are just sort of uh, different examples of how this can happen. I think a lot of it has to do with awareness and with finding what works best for your team and it can be very creative solutions. Uh, speaking of creative solutions, the last point that I want to make, let me check that I'm, I have a couple, one minute um, or so, is about uh, scheduling and, and checking in regularly with people on your team. And this is especially important when uh, you have virtual teams or remote teams or just 
dispersed teams where, uh, you know, you're not necessarily uh, bumping into people in the kitchen or, or in the office. Uh, this is important for leaders, but also team members, the way of remaining connected, connected and making sure everything goes well. Uh, however, of course, there's time and um, you don't want to ha also have 500 meetings a day, right? So um, as I was reviewing the research and the literature on the topic, there's some very creative ways that you can do that. For example, there's some leaders that have office hours where they have similarly to, you know, professor's office hours that have two hours a week allocated to short meetings so that instead of having to schedule separate uh, team meetings, um, anybody who has an issue or concern they want to discuss it is fairly brief. They can just, you know, jump jump on the call at, at those two hours. And so that's a way to kind of block that time so that people know that, you know, instead of interrupting or trying to find times on the calendar. It's a way of remaining connected. We hear a lot lately about these informal coffee happy hours that are happening. And these are tools, again, that uh, are great for virtual employees. And, and maybe there will be ways to continue those when everybody's back in the office to make people feel connected. And then um, other ways of engaging um, uh, employees and, and, and provide opportunities for regular check-ins is to have activities that can be light, but also it can be connected with what you do, like quickly or monthly themes. Um, I spoke with an organization recently who did, was doing that with the ERGs, their employee resource groups. So that would have, for example, uh, one week it could be, you know, um, the theme was a cross-cultural communication, I'm just giving you an example. And so the team, the employee resource groups um, uh, would provide uh, resources on the topic or schedule um, event, you know, online events or do quick presentation or um, they would dress up. You know, there was a lot of, again, really creative ways. This is just a way to engage everyone. Uh, and before I wrap up, you know, the one thing, one quick thing to mention is that uh, I know, you know, when you think about restructuring your communication and, and, you know, and all these new ways of communicating, it may seem like it's a lot of work and a lot of additional time. But what I would like to, you know, uh, mention is that it's actually going to save you time in the long run because by having more consistent communication, more inclusive communication, you are sort of preventing misunderstandings, you're preventing, um, you know, teams doing things differently, you're actually creating more effective teams by having more inclusive and, and, and communication. So I am done with this and, and still I don't know if there's any questions or uh, I know that we are at time. We are at time. We had one question about video calls and yes. whether those are something to be used and there are a few opinions on the so if you'd like to share yeah, what you think definitely. about it. That's a, actually a great uh, when we were talking about, you know, topics for discussion and guidelines, that would be a great topic for discussion. You know, what are the expectations about being on video? Is that something that you expect for your teams? You know, it could um, uh, be a challenge in some cases. And so if uh, either technology or, you know, people abilities to be on video, depending on where they're calling from and so on. And so that's definitely, I would say that there's not necessarily one, um, um, you know, one strategy it has to be sort of customized to the needs of your team and, and, and your organization. Thank you. And I don't know, Fanny, if you have an opinion on the videos. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing I would suggest is what Laura just mentioned. First, ask people how they feel because each group of people is different. Um, and th the points that they were making, make sure that you're aware of time zones, make it voluntary, never force people to use video. Sometimes they have bandwidth issues as well that you need to be aware of. And then... Um, one of the things that have been exposed with this constant zooming all the time is that mm -hmm. people are very aware of an intrusion in their personal lives. You get to see people's dogs and kids and the house and the decor. Sometimes people find it amusing and they laugh. Sometimes people feel really um, sort of intruded. So it, it should be optional and organizations should provide white backgrounds or some kind of background for people in case they want to use them so that those that don't want to show their houses, they don't have to. Um, it's really to be in tune like Laura was just describing. Um, thank you so much to both of you. I think this was so informative. Uh, I always learn uh, so much from 
when the conversation around inclusion comes up. So I hope all the participants got something out of this. We will continue at two o'clock Eastern time with diving more into how you now have the opportunity to rethink the workflow and build in learning uh, moments inside that workflow as opposed to trying to um, shift and retrain everybody uh, in mass. So hopefully you'll be able to join us and tune in at two o'clock. And until that time, we'll have one question for all of you to share your thoughts. If you have any interesting practices or tools that your organization is implementing or considering to promote a more inclusive workplace, please do share with others. Thank you so much, Thank you, everyone. And see you